Howdy. Um, welcome to uh, my talk on getting started with KiCad and uh, designing a mini badge or whatever else you want to design. So to start out with, uh, my name is Hamster. Uh, I also go by Steve Ball in uh, uh, places that aren't St. Con, DEF CON, whatnot. Um, I'm a system engineer by trade. Uh, that's just mostly a fancy way of uh, saying that I'm the guy that has to make the customer happy with our product. Uh, so for me, uh, it's very uh, rewarding and de-stressing to sit down and make these cool little mini badges and, uh, bad and other badges. So this is uh, kind of my passion and my hobby and the thing that keeps me up at night. So speaking of mini badges, the uh, mini badge is a nice little form factor. Um, it's only about an inch square or 0.8 inches square. Uh, it's a fixed form factor, unlike uh, there's uh, some other uh, formats out there, like uh, DEF CON has popularized the SAO or shitty add-on, which doesn't really have a size associated with it. So you end up with uh, add-ons that are all kinds of different sizes. Uh, the mini badge has usually about this size. You can make them a little bit bigger, but the problem that comes is the, the boards are really designed to use this size. So it, it constrains what you can put on there, but it also is nice that you know it's a known form factor. Uh, you don't have to worry about power. You don't have to worry about, for the most part, microprocessors. You don't have to worry about a lot of things. So it makes it really easy to get into designing your first PCB when you just need to have something like if you just want a blinky or something like that, that it's really easy to hook it up uh, and plug it into a badge and not worry about all the uh, low-level uh, specifics. And what this really means is that all of you out here can make your own mini badge. If you can get art into a computer, you can make a mini badge. It's not that difficult. It's just a matter of learning uh, a couple of things about designing PCBs and using the software. Uh, so to that end, before I go to the next slide, I've got some prizes up here. Does anybody know what PCB stands for? All right. Hopefully that survived. All right. So a printed circuit board, uh, which consists of layers of insulation like uh, FR4, which is a fiberglass uh, uh, insulation, uh, copper, printed graphics. Uh, one of the weird things you'll find with uh, boards is that they like to specify the board size in millimeters. But when you get down to the traces and the spaces, it's usually in mils, which are not millimeters, but are thousandths of an inch. Some board houses will do millimeters, but almost everyone designs in mils. So a little bit of confusion there. So various components of the printed circuit board. Uh, you have vias, which are the drill holes. And the drill holes can either be plated or unplated, depending on what application you have for them. Usually mounting holes are unplated. Uh, things that you need to basically make a circuit to connect from one side to the other will be plated. Uh, traces are the thin copper lines. Those are your wires. Uh, pores are usually what we refer to as large areas of copper. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer. No one's actually pouring copper on it, but it's just the nomenclature. Uh, the boards start out completely covered in copper, and then copper is removed. And then finally, you have... Uh, uh, on top of that, I'm missing it here, you have solder mask that goes on top of it that prevents solder from getting onto some of the, the copper. And then on top of that, you have the silk screen. So looking at a two-layer stack up here, you kind of get the idea of what it looks like. Uh, you've got your core layer and then the, the solder or the, the copper. Your vias uh, come through the board. Uh, you have your solder mask that covers everything. Uh, not really presented here very well is the uh, silk screen. So this is a two-layer board, which means you have copper on the front and the back of the board. And this is pretty typical of uh, most boards. And most of the boards you're going to be making are probably going to be two-layer boards. But that doesn't mean you have to limit yourself to two layers. If you have a really complicated design and you need more space, you can just keep stacking more layers onto it. You're going to pay uh, an extra price to go to more layers, but things like the iPhone that's in your pocket, some of those boards are 16-layer boards. So. The, the possibility is there to, to get more wires into a smaller space. As for the circuit boards themselves, there's different finishes that you can have on the, the circuit board. 
depending on what you want it to look like. You've seen the circuit board. Some of them look silver. Some of them look gold. Uh, that's something you would specify when you go to order the board, how you want to do it. Uh, OSP uh, is a good uh, uh, gold color, but you have to be careful with it. Uh, uh, handle it with your hands, or if you get uh, isopropyl alcohol on it, it'll tarnish it. So if you're looking for a tarnished look, like if you want to make that Nuka-Cola badge, uh, this is a good way to go. Uh, Hassle is the default because it's really cheap. Uh, basically, they dip it in solder and blow hot air across it to level it out. The uh, 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 Electrus Nickel Immersion Gold is a little bit more expensive, not that much more expensive, and especially if you're doing large quantities, it doesn't add much to the price. And I found that that's usually the one that uh, uh, does really well. Like it, it doesn't tarnish, it doesn't stain, and it stays a nice gold color. So if you're looking for that kind of color on your circuit board, that's the one you really want to go for. Different board houses will offer different things. Some of them will be uh, places that only offer OSP and other places that only offer ENG. So it's really kind of up to you which way you want to go. So printed circuit boards are the way you design it you end up with a file format that's called a Gerber. It has nothing to do with babies, trust me on this. Uh, the, it's an ASCII format that describes the, the boards. If you're at all familiar kind of with G code for like your 3D printers or CNC mills, it feels a lot like that. Uh, it was released back in 1980 and we're still using it. Like everything else, we're still using it. Uh, but it's still working pretty good, so it, it doesn't have to be terribly complicated. Uh, Printed circuit boards at its core, it's just the, the Gerber file is describing a set of vectors, right? So run this point to this point and make it this thick. So anything like when you have any curved traces on your board, that's just a series of little points. So that's why if you have a board of a lot of artwork, it's going to be uh, a lot of uh, kilobytes worth of space. So let's talk about artwork for PCBs. When you design your artwork, you want to bear in mind the limitations you're going to have in uh, getting this fab at the board house. One of the things that you'll find is that you have a limited color palette. Uh, you can use lots of things to give you slightly different colors. You've got gold or silver for your copper, different colors of solder mask, different colors of silk screen. You can put copper under the solder mask to give you a different tone of solder mask, so you can have like a two-tone effect. There's lots of ways that you can get uh, a little bit more color out of it, but you're still limited. There are some board houses that are starting to offer the idea of having multi-color silk screen. Uh, there's not many of them that are doing it, and you're probably going to pay a premium. But I do see uh, board houses are probably going to be offering that more in the future. I, I feel that like uh, as the hacker community grows and we start doing this kind of stuff, especially the Chinese board houses are really responsive to that kind of demand. Uh, when you're making your design, try to simplify it. Tiny details will get lost. The printed circuit boards will print really small details, but if you get too crazy with the tiny ones, you'll get your board in and it'll be all kind of muddled up. Uh, for gradients, you don't really want to have gradients in your color. Um, since you have just a couple of colors, you can't really uh, make them uh, gradiated. Uh, but you could do half tones, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When you're designing your artwork, try to stay in vector as much as possible. And the reason for this is it scales really well. And there's a step I'll show you in a minute that makes that really critical. So if you're starting out in Photoshop to make your uh, uh, design, try to get it imported into Illustrator or Inkscape and convert it into a vector before you proceed with getting it into the board. You'll be much happier. If you don't know how to use Inkscape or Illustrator, Now's the time to learn. So halftones, uh, they allow you to simulate gradients by using dots. And I am not the greatest person at halftones. You can see my horrible uh, twinkle twinkie here. Didn't turn out all that well. The cassette tape for the DCZ badge turned out a lot better. Uh, however, at least in KiCad, when you do the 3D render, it doesn't like all those little elements and it really chokes. So uh, a lot of times I won't put the gradient into uh, a KiCad until almost the last step. Otherwise, I'm looking at like, click the button, update uh, the 3D render, and go get a Coke for a little while, you know? 
When you're designing your artwork, I work through Illustrator. What I like to do, well, you want to design your board one-to-one. -one. So in Illustrator, you know, make your board so that it, like in Illustrator, if you're going to make your board an inch tall, make it an inch tall in Illustrator. Otherwise, you're going to deal with scaling hell. Uh, if you just make it an arbitrary size in Illustrator, when you bring it into KiCad, now you've got to like figure out how to like scale it on import because once you get it into KiCad, you can't rescale it. You can only scale it on import, and it's a lot easier to deal with scaling here in Illustrator. I like to use a separate artboard for each layer so I can see what the stack up looks like. And then for each layer that you're going to export to go into KiCad, keep it black and white. Uh, the importer in KiCad does not support colors. It's going to choke on colors. Or more along the lines of you can threshold uh, what it considers black and white. So for the least headaches and to make things look like you expect they're looking, uh, make sure that you just keep it in black and white. When you're exporting, you would think that you'd go like 300 DPI. Go far higher than that. I usually go 1,200 to 2,400 DPI. And the reason for this is you're coming out of Illustrator as a vector into a raster format, and the KiCad importer converts raster back into the Gerber vector format. So if you don't have really high DPI, KiCad is going to basically round off all your corners. You can see in the example images here how I lost sharpness by going with lower DPI. So this is a really critical step, step to getting really clean imports into KiCad. Um, new versions of uh, plugins are coming out all the time for KiCad. There's some stuff out there now that allows you to import SVGs natively into KiCad, but uh, they're still a little crunchy. They're not quite ready for prime time, I don't think. Also, when you're designing an Illustrator, you can design your board outline. So you can make the actual outline of what you want the board to look like. Well, when you're designing it in Illustrator, um, it's going to make curves. KiCad can't handle any curves on the DXF import. So what you're going to have to do there is basically zoom into the path that you want to be the board outline, add a bunch of control points, and then go in and simplify the curve to straight lines. So then when you bring it into KiCad, it won't choke on it. Otherwise, KiCad will either not import it, or it'll only import to straight lines and you'll get lots of gaps. Uh, you can do the outline itself in KiCad if you don't want to deal with this step, um, but sometimes on more complicated boards, it's useful to make the outline in uh, Illustrator where you can make it like an offset of your design or something. So, we're speaking a little bit about uh, uh, KiCad here. Uh, KiCad has been around since 1992. It's an open source platform for developing boards. It uh, covers both schematic capture and board design. Uh, it has a 3D preview, and it's very actively developed. There's a lot of good features in here. Uh, I've come to KiCad from using uh, uh, Altium and using uh, uh, Eagle, and KiCad is my go-to for designing boards, and especially dealing with artwork. It does really well with designing nice artwork. Uh, and Earlier this year, the first KiCad Con was held in Chicago. So there's a lot of excitement around KiCad. And I, I feel as we go forward, we're going to find neat plugins coming out to help improve this process of doing artistic PCBs. So the first step of bringing stuff into KiCad is you want to design your schematic. And it's called schematic capture. The, you don't really want to skip this step. Even if you have a simple PCB that's just like an LED and a resistor, and the, the connector for the, the mini badge or whatnot. Uh, do your schematic because it's going to help you later when you do DRC. If you skip this step, then DR, DRC is not going to work for you later. The other thing you should get in the habit of when you're doing your schematic is keep it neat. Like clean it up. Make sure you have things laid out nice. Uh, when you're doing something really simple, it may be easy to overlook that step, but as you get into more complicated circuits, it's just, write, just like writing code. You can write some spaghetti code today that works, and you come back to it from six months uh, from now, and you're like, who was the moron that wrote this code? Same thing happens when you're designing your, your schematic. So to import into KiCad, 
Uh, it has an importer utility, which you basically just uh, point it to what uh, image you want to import. It will automatically detect the scaling information. So it will take care of all that for you. If you didn't scale correctly, this is the uh, box that you're going to be entering in how to scale things. You're going to match one DPI to another DPI. So again, one-to-one -one is the way to go for less headaches here. Uh, don't worry too much about what layer your stuff ends up on. Uh, either put it on uh, the front silk screen or the, uh, uh, the front solder mask for now. Uh, we'll move it around later. After you get it imported, then you can open it in the footprint editor and you can move things around into different layers. Uh, you can choose to make your, your footprint for your artwork either be a stack up of all your art or you can have it broken out into individual pieces like here's my copper footprint, here's my silkscreen footprint. It's really up to you how you want to stack this up. Uh, one thing that I will mention on solder mask, if you have an area that you want to be clear copper, you need to put a solder mask shape over the top of it in order to expose that copper. By default on a board, they're going to put solder mask over the entirety of a board. So any shape that you put on the solder mask is a negative shape, and that's going to be the cutout. So if you had like a solid copper pour, and you had a cutout that had your handle on it, when you get the board back, you're going to see your handle in copper. So that's how you get that effect. Uh, this is also important if you're doing like uh, an LED bleed through where you're bleeding through uh, an LED through a board like on the, the St. Con badge where the, all these uh, lights are backlit. That's how that's done is you have to remove the solder mask and the copper and then you just have the bare FR4 which is transmittive uh, to LED light. And depending on how thick you get the, the PCB board, which is an option when you buy it, it'll either be brighter or more diffuse. So in your schematic, once you're done with your schematic, you'll go through one step where you'll associate footprints to parts. So you've got a symbol for uh, a, an LED, but what is that, a, an 0603, a 1206? This is a step where you physically associate this symbol as this part. If you're used to eagle, eagle is more of a, a heavy symbol sort of thing where you bring in a symbol that's both the symbol and the footprint. KiCad is more of a light symbol, where the symbol and the footprint don't necessarily go together uh, initially. You add them together at the end, so you can have a single symbol and multiple footprints that associate with that. Uh, just This is a step that you'll have to do in order to get the proper footprints to come into the board editor. In your board editor, you'll create a new, imp uh, new layout, import your parts from your schematic, um, import your outline if you made one, or create your outline. Uh, import your imported uh, art and you can just drag it around and place it on the board. Uh, I've seen some people that will make art that they'll add some registration marks that are outside the board outline so that you can line up the registration marks. I haven't really had much issue with uh, uh, designing or stacking my art up without registration marks so it's really kind of up to you. The next piece of it is you want to solve your rat's nest. So initially, you're going to get these little ghost lines on the screen that are where KiCad from the schematic knows that this pad needs to hook to this pad. So your goal, and this is the zen part of designing circuit boards as far as I'm concerned, is going in and solving the rats, like moving, like drawing the traces, making them all neat, uh, or whatever you want to do with them. You can do some more art in the traces. Uh, Usually the traces uh, only support straight lines or angle lines. You can do uh, rounded lines in KiCad by making little steps. So it's entirely possible to do. Also here, you're going to want to pay attention to your trace and space. And that means how fat the traces are and how far apart the traces are. Most board houses, 6 mil is their standard for what uh, they'll support. If you, you can get smaller than that, some board houses will go down to like three mil or so, but you're gonna pay a premium for that. I recommend that when you design your boards, go into KiCad and configure it for the minimum trace size you want to pay for. Usually I set it to six to seven mil. Uh, that way when I'm designing, the, when I'm laying out the traces, KiCad will automatically come up and give me collision warnings so that I know that, hey, I made it too close here or uh, prevent me from doing something stupid. When you 
design your artwork, if you have a large copper pour or anything copper in your artwork, TICAD doesn't consider that when it's doing its DRC checks. So that means you can put a trace or a via right into your copper of your art and short it out, and KiCad can't detect that currently. So just be cognizant of that when you're, when you're designing your board, that if you have copper, copper pours especially in your artwork, make sure that you're doing the right thing and not accidentally shorting out half of your board by using a copper pour. Finally, run DRC on your board. Uh, this is the design rules check. It's just one option, you click on it, it'll go through your board and it'll tell you, hey, these things are too close, or you've got a footprint overlapping another footprint, are you sure you want to proceed? And you'll get a feel for what DRC errors you can live with, what, what you're actually going for. Maybe you want that battery box to be over the top of some parts and that's okay. But DRC will save your bacon in a lot of ways. It'll tell you, hey, you have something shorted or you have something too close. And this will save you a lot of costly mistakes where you send out a board and you get it back in and you realize, ah, I didn't hook up that ground plane to anything. DRC will say, hey, you forgot the ground plane. So trust me, this is uh, very important. The last thing you want to do is export it uh, to a Gerber. Um, the board house that you're going through will likely have a how-to. They'll likely have some pages that are like, hey, if you're using KiCad, you do it this way. Some board houses will take KiCad files natively. You can send them your KiCad file and they can deal with it. I personally feel a little squeamish about sending out my actual source design files to a fab. I prefer to send them Gerber files because it makes it harder for someone to reverse engineer something that I did. But it really depends on what you want to do. Plus, I know with Gerber files that when I send one of them out that I know what I wanted it to look like. I know exactly how I want it to be, so I don't have to argue with them about, well, in KiCad, make sure you select this option, right, for like tinting vias or something. Uh, always make sure that you check your Gerber before you send it out. KiCad has a Gerber viewer. There's Gerber viewers online where you can import the Gerber layers and you can verify, hey, this looks right or uh, something messed up here. I find a lot of times this is really useful for verifying my silkscreen. Um, I'll look at the silk screen and I'll discover, oh, I put a reference designator under a part. That's never going to work. So it allows me to come back and make sure that I got that the way I want it to be. When you order your boards, you might consider getting panels made. Uh, there's some open source tools. I've got a link to one here uh, that's called uh, PCB Panelizer or Gerber Panelizer that allows you to take uh, your individual designs and panel them. I've got a couple of examples of some panels that I've had made here. So the nice thing about doing panels like this is that you can have multiple designs on one panel and a lot of board houses will allow you to run this as though it was a single circuit board for cheaper. Uh, some board houses will charge you more for panels. It really kind of depends. But the nice thing is, is when you get one of these in, if you ordered a uh, solder mask or a silk screen, what am I trying to say here? Um, a, a stencil for your solder paste, when you put this down, you can stencil this whole board at once. So basically you can put your solder paste on six of these guys at a time, place them all and do six of them at a time instead of do them one by one. So if you're doing, you know, uh, 150 of these for DEF CON or something, uh, it definitely helps speed up the process so that you're not spending your entire summer soldering things up. So ordering boards. These are some of the typical options that you'll see. Uh, as long as your boards are less than 100 millimeters square, you can usually get their proto price. A lot of the board houses, especially the Chinese board houses, offer this for less than $5. You can get 10 100 millimeter square boards for $5 plus shipping. Uh, a lot of the shipping options they have is like uh, DHL for about $20, $25 from Shenzhen. So that's like two day turnaround for, the, uh, for shipping. And typically, I can get a board, like they'll finish a board in about three days. I've had it entirely happen where I ordered on a Sunday night, and the following Monday, I had the package in my hand with my boards for about 25, 30 bucks. So it's definitely worthwhile to uh, uh, go with that option when you're designing this stuff, even when you're prototyping. I mean, even if you make a mistake, 30 bucks isn't the end of a world, and you've learned something. Uh, and at the very least, maybe you've got a cool design that you can give out as a coaster. Who knows, right? Uh, 
you can play with the options here to get different effects. Uh, if you want thinner boards, if you want them to flex a little bit, or if you want fatter boards, if you don't want them to flex at all. Um, if you want different colors of silk screen, I'm sorry, silk screen and solder mask, this is where you would configure it. You may be somewhat limited on your choices unless you pay extra for some of the colors and choices. Uh, for instance, I use seed a lot. Uh, they, in their basic option, I can choose multiple colors of a, a solder mask, but my options are usually either you get white silk screen for all these colors, unless it's white, and then you get black silk screen, and that's it, unless you want to pay extra, and then you can get crazy with the, the color matching. Uh, dangerous thing here is that sometimes an extra 100 boards is just a couple more bucks, and the next thing you know, you've got 1,500 boards in your cart, and they arrive, and you're like, what am I going to do with all these stupid boards? So it's easy to get carried away with ordering boards. When you go to order them, you've got multiple options for getting uh, them fabbed. The Chinese board houses are cheap, but you're going to have to wait for shipping. But, I mean, DHL, like literally I can get a package shipped out of Shenzhen to my house in about two and a half days. That's about as good as getting it like USPS in the United States, so it's not a huge deal. Uh, and the price isn't that bad. Uh, you can get it slow boated from uh, China uh, if you're willing to wait like three weeks if you want to save like 10 bucks on shipping. Uh, the quality out of China is pretty good. Uh, I usually don't have any issues with it. Uh, expect that if there's any questions, the, the refrain that's usually here with uh, dealing with China is delay one day. Uh, because they will ask you a question in the middle of the night, and even if you're up in the middle of the night and you respond instantly, I guarantee they won't, re won't respond to you until the next day. I don't know what's going on with that. I think that they're just buying themselves a little bit of time there, but it's just what it is. And the final piece of that is language barriers. We've all seen like fun examples of English where they, they can say the words, and I feel that they know what they mean, but they don't, it, it's hard to communicate what exactly is going on. Um, I recently had a, an exchange with a, a vendor where I had a board that didn't have any drill holes in it, but I'd ordered four boards, and it was just one of the boards that didn't have drill holes, and they sent me an email about it, and they're like, uh, is it okay to proceed with no punch holes? I'm like, what is a punch hole? And we went back and forth on it, and I finally discovered, it. oh, they mean just this one board, and it, it worked out, but uh, it can be fun. In the United States, uh, Oshpark is a great option if you like purple PCBs. Uh, they have a new option for After Dark, which is a black with a uh, clear solder mask, which is a really neat look. Um, and it's a fairly reasonable price. They'll give you uh, like three copies of your design for like, I want to say $5 per square inch, which isn't bad. It's more expensive than the Chinese places, but it's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, as far as assembly, you can have the fabs assemble your stuff for you. You send them a pick and place file that KiCad generates that tells them where to place the parts. You send out a bomb, uh, your bill of materials, uh, to basically say this is the parts that I want to go on there um, and have them do all the work and you end up with finished boards. But that can get pricey. There's going to be a setup fee. There's going to be a fee per part placed. You've got to pay their part cost on the parts unless you send them parts, which has its own issues. Uh, so if you're doing like a thousand boards, you probably want to get them fabbed because you don't, again, want to waste your summer uh, trying to like sit in, uh, under a microscope with a pair of tweezers. But uh, by the same token, if you're doing something simple, you're doing a few of them, Consider just doing it by hand. It's really not that bad. Uh, the process I use for these guys, uh, I solder paste, I place the components by hand, and I have a $25 Black & Decker griddle that I put them on the griddle, turn the griddle all the way up, and wait until the solder flows. And it works great. So it's not that painful. Um, to that end, I would also suggest that if you're uh, scared of doing surface mount, do surface mount. It is way easier than doing through hole in all aspects. It's smaller parts. I know that that's intimidating. You can get like 1206, 0805s, which are reasonable sized parts. I find even 0402s are easy to work with. Um, 
Now, if you go and do the surface mount solder challenge downstairs where uh, Rushan's using 0102s, now, that's not something I would recommend. That's like dust size. But uh, the nice thing about surface mount is you apply your paste, you stick your components on, and you heat it up. The surface tension of the solder will adjust the location of the parts. Uh, you can't see on here, but I have a microcontroller that in this little square here is a 20-pin part. It's a QFN, 20-pin, four-sided part with a solder pad in the middle. And I griddle these and have no failures. So the solder paste will flow into the right place, and uh, the solder mask will keep it out of the places it shouldn't be, and you have very little cleanup to do afterwards. It is really nice. Um, speaking of sourcing parts, you have multiple options for getting your parts. Uh, AliExpress is a good place for getting parts if you have the time and you're willing to risk it. Um, I have had before, I ordered some battery boxes off of AliExpress, and I made sure I got the ones that had the polarity that I wanted, and they arrived, and I discovered I now had completed boards and 100 battery boxes with the reverse polarity. So I now have a lot of battery boxes. So anyone needs battery boxes, I'm your battery box guy now. Uh, there's some other options. If you want to get even cheaper than AliExpress, there is some Chinese options that if you know a little bit of Mandarin, you can get through and uh, get even cheaper options, but eh, that's hit or miss, and you usually need a guide there. Um, if you need your AliExpress parts quicker, someone on Amazon is probably selling them with the prime markup. So if you're willing to pay you know, five times the cost, but you can get it tomorrow, uh, that's an option for you. The uh, tried and true options is uh, the DigiKeys, Mausers. Uh, they do a pretty good job. They have pretty much everything. Uh, they, you'll get used to price breaks, where if you buy one of something, it's a dollar, but if you buy a hundred of something, then they're like 20 cents a piece. So there's a, you kind of have to play with a scale a little bit. And again, it's like the PCBs when you order them. It's like, well, I don't need a thousand resistors, but it was cheaper than ordering 10 of them those kind of wacky things happen, so be cognizant of that. There's some other options out there, like Arrow. Uh, Arrow is kind of a, an oddball. They have weird specials from time to time. Like last year, they had a thing where it's like, order anything over $10 and we'll overnight it to you. It's like, for free? So, okay, I'll do that. Uh, let's see, two years ago, they had a uh, thing where if you bought more than $40 apart, they'd tack on a free Raspberry Pi. So I ordered $200 worth of parts in separate orders, and I now am the king of Raspberry Pis. <laughs> the, uh, if your fab uh, is going to assemble it, uh, usually it's best to let them source the parts. They usually have fairly decent prices, uh, and they have the connections with their vendors. If you decide to send them parts, like let's say, for instance, you get in on a group buy for a microprocessor, which is totally something that happened to me this last year. Um, I could get microprocessors for $10 a piece, or I went into this group buy and I got them for $5 a piece. Because in a group buy, we were able to buy 1,000 of them, but I just needed 75 of them. Well, then I had to turn around and mail these processors to China. And it's the most amazing thing. It cost me $25 to DHL overnight stuff from Shenzhen, but if I DHL into China, that same delivery would be like $150. Uh, I chose in this instance to go with uh, the about $80 USPS service, and they attempted to do the delivery in China on a Sunday when the fab was closed, and then they refused to re-deliver. So I had to convince someone at the fab to drive an hour from the fab to the post office to pick up the package so that they could complete my board order. It worked out. I can't believe it worked out. but. That's some of uh, the, the fun stuff that uh, you're going to deal with. Um, let's see here. And that's about it. So anyone have uh, any uh, questions? Sure. Uh, to create a solder mask. Uh, it's the same thing that uh, you would do for um, creating any of your other artwork. Uh, let me see if I can back up here. There we go. So on this screen, you can see I have silk screen and solder mask called out. 
Uh, solder mass is just an end of our art layer. So what you're looking at, the thing to remember with a solder mask here is that it, it being a negative layer, you just got to think uh, uh, as it being negative. So where you have your artwork is where there's not going to be solder mask. See what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, when you go to order them, uh, like on my page here where I have uh, examples, it's hard to see, I, I know, for, especially from back there. Uh, you can see this area here where you see the different color dots kind of on the screen there. They usually have an area where you can specify what color you want. Uh, and bear in mind, too, that uh, depending on whether or not you have copper underneath the solder mask, that will subtly change the tone of uh, the solder mask. And some of the colors, like the, the yellow color, um, I don't have an example here, some vendors have a really good yellow, and some vendors have a yellow that was really well suited to my uh, poop emoji. So there's a sliding scale there. I uh, had one guy that convinced a board house to custom make up a pink color for, I think he was making like a Pac-Man ghost, I want to say. Uh, and the prototype came out perfect. And he ordered his actual run and they came in and they were really washed out pink. So he had to go back to the fab and say, uh, can you actually remake these because this pink isn't quite right. So it, it is worthwhile to do some prototypes where you order some small quantities to get a feel for a particular vendor's, you know, this is our, the standard red color or standard blue color from this vendor. Any other questions? All right, well, uh, thank you all for coming. Or, sorry. I usually use seed. They've been pretty good to me. Um, I've talked to some other people that haven't had as good of experience. Uh, the thing that I find with seed is that they tend to offer a lot of specials, and usually when they offer a special, they get swamped. So, you kind of got to watch their website to see what the current special is to get an idea if, if your board is going to make it in that week time frame or if it's going to be a little longer. Uh, I have some friends that use PCBWay and they really like that. Um, we did the uh, DC801 badge with all PCB and that worked out pretty well. Um, it's kind of whatever flavor you want, they're all slightly different. Like. Uh, I tried using, uh, uh, I think it was PCB way to do some panels, and I submitted one of these panels, and they came back to me and said, oh, you have a panel, we're going to charge you 10 times the price for this panel. Whereas I went to seed, and I submitted the panel, and they're like, here's your panel. There wasn't any extra charge. So it kind of depends on what you're after. And different board houses will have different options and different colors, and so... Yeah, um, that's a good question. Depending on the setup fees and whatnot, um, I'm thinking here, so on the uh, DC Zia badge, we did a run of 75, and the board setup fee, I'm wanting to say it was something like a couple of hundred dollars, so it added probably about 10 or 12 dollars to each board to, for the setup fee, and then you had to also factor in the, uh, uh, the component cost uh, I mean, we'd be buying those components elsewhere anyway. Um, it's not unreasonable to have them assembled. And sometimes you'll run into specials, like Seed has been offering a lot of specials lately where they'll assemble five boards for no setup fee. Uh, and they have a pretty good parts catalog where they have really cheap parts that are in stock. Um, so it, it, it really kind of depends. Uh, it's quantities of scale. Uh, if you order a thousand of something, it's going to be a lot cheaper for you than ordering a hundred of something. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so you're asking about uh, how you create the stencil. 
Uh, the stencil is created from your solder mask layer. Uh, so, well, there, there is an actual paste layer, I should say. In KiCad, when you're designing your board, uh, your surface mount parts will have a paste layer that says, leave this aperture open for the paste. And you would submit the paste layer to your manufacturer and they would laser cut your stencil. So usually, uh, like a stencil that I would get for one of these boards would probably be about, I want to say about $10 for the stencil. So, and the stencil comes in, it's a metal plate about that big. So, all right, well, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and if you have any further questions or anything like that, um, oops, uh, you can uh, hit me up on uh, Twitter. Uh, my uh, GitHub is uh, listed here somewhere. Eh. Well, anyway, hamster on Twitter, uh, hamster on GitHub, and uh, if, if you have any questions or whatnot, uh, I try to open source all my designs. Uh, they're all available on, uh, on GitHub, and I'm trying to create more training stuff so that uh, you can find tutorials, you can find like some templates to, to get yourself started. Um, but anyway, 